Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Over the next few lectures, we are going to talk about common neonatal problems, and the issue that we are going to discuss today is prematurity and low birth weight. So we are going to talk about small babies, the tiny babies, very very tiny babies, can be as small as one's hand. We try to understand what prematurity is and how do you differentiate it from low birth weight. Why is it important to understand prematurity and low birth weight, not only in the context of baby's health, but also in the context of the family and the society as such. What are the causes and the etiological factors that may lead to prematurity and low birth weight? How do we go about assessing the gestation of a newborn baby? What difficulties one can encounter, the problems and the complications that can occur in these babies? Managing a premature baby can sometimes be a big ordeal, but we are going to have a broad overview of the management and we touch upon the common aspects in day-to-day -day management and what is the outcome of the premature babies. So, human baby is considered term when it's born at 280 days after the last menstrual period. But remember that only 4% babies are born at this period of 280 days to be exact. However, some 70% would be born within a window of 10 days from this 280 days. Hence, we take this range as the term. So any baby born before this range would be considered a premature baby or a preterm baby and any baby born after this range would be considered a postterm baby. But what is the exact definition of prematurity? The consensus definition as given by WHO is that any baby born before 37 weeks from the first day of the last menstrual period is considered a premature baby. Now they can be early premature babies or they can be late premature babies. We are going to talk about that. The other thing that we need to understand is what low birth weight is. So as the definition goes, any baby who is born with a birth weight of 2500 grams or less is called a low birth weight baby. Now a low birth weight baby can be a premature baby but not necessarily that all low birth weight babies would be premature. Some of the full term babies and as a matter of fact some of the post term babies may also weigh less than 2500 grams and if that is the case these term or post term babies would be labeled as what we call intrauterine growth restricted babies or small for gestational age babies. If we look at the burden of prematurity we really don't have the exact data but uh, a global estimation is that 11 to 13 percent babies globally are born premature and of course that would differ from one region to other region from one geographical area to other geographical area. If you talk about Pakistan, there is an estimation by WHO that as much as 15%, actually maybe a little more than 15% are born premature. If we look at the regional data, again you can appreciate very clearly that South Asia where Pakistan lies is uh, one of the areas where there is the high, highest proportion of premature babies. More than 13% are born premature. So what about low birth weight? Babies weighing less than 2500 grams may be premature babies or full term babies. So data from USA suggests that 8% would be low birth weight. But of these 8% low birth weight babies, one third are born after 37 weeks, meaning by that they are low birth weight, but they are 
either full term or post term hence they are intra uterine growth restricted so one third of all low birth weight babies in usa are low birth weight the situation is pretty inverse in the developing countries where 70% of the low birth weight infants are intra uterine growth restricted and only 30% are premature babies now this has got very important implication because of course prematurity have its own problems and complications and issues but intra uterine growth restriction even if it occurs in the term babies has got its implication with a greater morbidity and mortality than the appropriately grown just gestationally grown babies if we look at the deaths of children under the age of 5 years we can easily appreciate that more than 40% deaths occur in the neonatal period and if you segregate these neonatal deaths into the various causes you can see that 27% of deaths are attributed directly to prematurity there are another about 25% deaths which may not be directly linked with prematurity but they might be linked indirectly with prematurity like for example because of infections congenital infections or congenital malformations or because of genetic reasons so as much as 50% deaths may be attributed directly or indirectly to the premature birth now this is a very interesting graph you can easily see that the neonatal mortality rate which is actually death of babies till the age of 28 days per 1000 live births so in areas where the neonatal mortality rate is high as is ours the proportion of deaths because of prematurity is less compared to the proportion of deaths because of prematurity in areas where neonatal mortality rate is low like in western countries the reason is that in our setup we struggle with other causes of neonatal deaths asphyxia neonatal tetanus diarrhea um, sepsis and so many other things so these are the things which have been taken care of in the western societies and there the burden is more of the premature deaths contributing to the neonatal mortality so what are the etiological factors that may lead to prematurity now one need to appreciate that most of the preterm births are spontaneous there is some link to genetic predisposition and there is some role of endocrine genetic relationship as well however there are some identifiable factors that we can appreciate and if we identify them earlier we can maybe intervene in one preventing the premature birth and two safe delivery of the preterm baby and three the prompt management of these preterm babies so these factors are the maternal factors the fetal factors and the placenta factors if we talk about the maternal factors that can lead to prematurity uh, maternal malnutrition so un so common in our setup as is the maternal anemia teenage pregnancy multiparity twin pregnancy preeclampsia chronic maternal conditions medical conditions like diabetes renal diseases heart diseases they uh, can all lead to premature birth infection again very common in our setup malaria unitrack infections vaginosis um chorioamnionitis all of them can lead to premature birth of the baby smoking has been implicated with not only with the premature birth of the baby but also with intrauterine growth restriction as is the drug abuse mm. of course there would be large number of social reasons that can lead to premature birth including the financial conditions um illegitimate birth housing condition single parent family stress so many other things
the uterine and the placental causes by convert uterus incompetent cervicus placenta previa or abruptio placenta then there are inherent reasons within the fetus the fetal distress which is so common in our setup and there are so many reasons for fetal distress the picture sh here shows cord around the neck but there can be so many other reasons and we are going to talk about fetal distress leading to birth asphyxia in another lecture a very important topic for our setup but fetal distre distress can lead to premature birth of the baby multiple gestations we have talked about the genetic syndromes like down syndrome and so many other syndromes Interuterine infections, the congenital infections, the torch infections, toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, herpes, syphilis, erythroblastosis fetalis, and non-immune hydrops. These are the inherent fetal causes that can lead to premature birth. Now look at this picture. There are two babies, both born at term at 40 weeks of gestation. And you can see that one of them is small, much smaller than the other one. So this is the baby who although is born at term, but is small. If this baby is smaller in weight for the gestation age, the baby would be called small for gestational age or intrauterine growth restricted babies. Now the factors that lead to intrauterine growth restriction, many of them actually overlap with the etiological reasons and factors of prematurity. There might be some subtle differences that we'll see. So the placental factors, the fetal factors and maternal factors, all of them, if present in any baby or in any pregnancy, can lead to intrauterine growth restriction. We have talked about the fetal factors, the genetic link, the congenital infections, the congenital anomalies that can lead to intrauterine growth restriction as would irradiation. And we have talked about multiple gestation. Now, a very important thing that I want you to understand over here is that IUGR is associated with insulin deficiency. Either the production of insulin is faulty or the action of insulin is not appropriate at receptor level and is associated with deficiency of insulin like growth factor type 1. Now this is a very important concept because this concept has been linked with what we call Baker's hypothesis which suggests that babies who are born IUGR are likely to develop long term complications in the adult life in the form of hypertension, diabetes, mellitus, or metabolic syndrome. So in areas where the proportion of IGR babies is high, as in ours, there would be more chances of having adult diseases, the ones I have talked about. Placental causes, we have already talked about them, and the maternal causes, drugs, chronic illnesses, malnutrition, all of them are very, very important. So we have talked about the Packer's hypothesis linked with decreased insulin production or uh, decreased insulin action at the receptor level. Now, one thing that one needs to realize is that sometimes this intrauterine growth restriction of a baby might be a normal response of the fetus to the bad milieu or the environment the fetus is growing in and that can be because of so many reasons that we have talked about the placental reasons or uh, the cardiovascular reasons or maternal uh, malnutrition or maternal chronic illnesses and that would be in response to the bad nutritional or oxygen deprivation that the baby's growth would be restricted. So we need to actually monitor these babies for their growth and sometimes we might have to intervene and go in early and um, deliver the baby earlier so that we can save the life of the baby. IUGR babies can be symmetric or asymmetric babies. 
Symmetric babies are the ones where head size and the length and the weight are equally affected, while in asymmetric babies, head is relatively spared. So the growth restriction in symmetric IUGR would have started early in the pregnancy and those with asymmetric would occur late in the pregnancy. So this is very important for us to understand and we can assess this by calculating what we call the pontral index. The reasons are different and the implication might be different. So the reasons for symmetric IUGR are the chromosomal reasons, the genetic reasons, the malformations, teratogens, infections, or severe maternal hypertensivityologies. While in asymmetric or the IUGR which would occur a little late, maternal malnutrition is an important factor, fetal distress or preeclampsia, etc. So the same picture. So how do we say if we know the LMP or we know the EDD, we would be able to say that okay, both the babies are born at 40 weeks of gestation. But if we do not have that sort of information, which in our setting, especially, we would not have that information of EDD or LMP. So how do we go about assessing the gestational age of the baby to decide if the baby is term or preterm or for that matter post term we do that by a rapid visual assessment of the physical and the neurological characteristics there are various scoring system for that new ballard scoring system is the one which we use mostly and that take into account two criteria the physical maturity criteria and the neuromuscular criteria so this is what physical maturity criteria is. We look for the skin, the lenago, the small hair on the skin, creases on the plantar surfaces of the palm and the foot, uh, the breast nodule, the ear and the eye, uh, and external genitalia, both in male as well as female. And we give them score ranging from minus one to five. So for each of these physical criteria, higher the score, more mature the baby would be. Similarly, we look at the neuromuscular criteria where we look at the posture of the baby and we do certain maneuvers around the wrist joint, the square window maneuver, around elbow joint, the arm recoil maneuver, around knee joint, the popliteal angle, the scarf sign and heel to ear. Again, higher the score, most mature the baby would be. So when we look at these scores, we add the physical score and the neuromuscular score and then we can correlate them with the maturity. So you can appreciate that a score of say 15 would mean that the gestational age of the baby is 30 and if the score is say 45 the gestational age is 42 so on and so forth what problems can occur in premature babies they can have host of issues respiratory cardiovascular hematological gastrointestinal metabolic endocrine neurological renal and so many other things that can occur in premature babies. Just to give you an overview of acute problems, hypothermia is something very, very common that would occur in premature babies and there are various reasons to that. Their skin is not mature enough, they don't, do, do not have enough brown fat, um, they would tend to lose a lot of water, um, so, so uh, because of uh, uh, contact with the environment so they are likely to develop hypothermia again their glycogen stores in the liver are, are not good enough hypoglycemia would be the consequence they're likely to develop hypocalcemia the whole respiratory system is immature if the respiratory system is not mature enough to produce what we call surfactant they would cause them to have respiratory distress or respiratory distress syndrome 
or highland membrane disease because of their immaturity of the brain stem and their immaturity of the respiratory muscles like diaphragm they may actually go on to develop apneas they are prone to have intraventricular hemorrhages the liver is immature so one need to be careful with drugs premature are prone to develop infections some of them actually would be born premature because of the congenital infection that we have talked about the torch infections some of them might acquire perinatal infection if the birth does not take place in a safe and hygienic environment and some of them might develop nosocomial infections during their stay in the hospital or the nursery as a matter of fact these premature babies would continue to be at the risk of infection even if sent home so we need to be really very careful uh, with them as far as prevention of infection is concerned their kidneys are not mature not able to handle the solutes they may have hyponatremia or hypernatremia they may have issues with the potassium they may keep on spilling the glucose leading to poor weight gain glycosuria their gut is not mature and some of them there are certain risk factors we are going to talk about necrotizing in enterocolitis in detail at some other point but this is a very important uh, intestinal complication that one encounter in premature babies they are more likely to have patent ductus arteriosus again because of the circulatory reasons and also because of uh, uh, the um, oxygen therapy that would actually uh, would cause delay in the closure of the duct in 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 any baby especially in the premature babies so they are not uh, mature enough one to suck two to swallow three to tolerate the feet so there would be issues with their feeding uh, they are likely to develop anemia of prematurity retinopathy of prematurity is uh, actually attributed to the oxygen therapy but some of them even without oxygen therapy may actually develop retinopathy of prematurity but oxygen therapy increases the risk of retinopathy of prematurity many folds there might be problem with the, the bone metabolism leading to metabolic bone disease long term complications related with surfactant deficiency can cause them to have chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia there might be issues with the growth they might be deprived of the feeding because of the various reasons that we have talked about in the acute problems leading to poor growth cerebral palsy they may be born early and they might have suffered hypoxia or ischemia or intraventricular hemorrhage or leading to cerebral palsy hearing problem inherently because of the prematurity or because of the congenital infections or because of the autotoxic drugs that often are given to these premature babies we have talked about retinopathy of prematurity and even if they are not grossly cerebral palsy some of them may have behavioral issues or developmental delay now we do not do investigations to diagnose prematurity but for their management we have to have their baseline cbc we need to have their blood glucose we have talked about that the electrolytes and the calcium chest x ray when you suspect them to have a highland membrane disease or surfactant deficiency that would give you the ground glass appearance with ear bronchograms bilaterally ultrasound head to look for the intraventricular hemorrhage now the other thing is that we need to have a, a serial of these labs you need to see the trend of what is happening with their glucose with their electrolytes with their calcium and sometime with their cbc platelet count etc etc so these trends are very very important so babies whom you think have had uh, neurological insult around the time of the birth or little later you might want to do mri brain or ct brain but that is not something that is needed straight away that can be deferred uh, till few weeks after the birth 
all these babies need to be assessed for their vision and for their hearing and all of them should have a proper or uh, formal developmental assessment so like we mentioned in the beginning uh, managing a premature baby uh, can be really a big ordeal that, that would depend upon the size and the gestation of the baby what we are going to do is we are going to talk about an overview of the management not going into the in the nitty gritty and the details that perhaps can be discussed at some other time so at birth it is very important for us to anticipate preterm births when we talk about the maternal causes there are a large number of maternal causes if they are present we can identify them intervene and actually avert the preterm birth in the first place or for that matter birth of a IUGR baby taking care of the maternal nutrition taking care of the social factors taking care of the anemia taking care of the chronic illnesses good diabetic control good blood pressure control sort of things so this can avoid the preterm birth in the first place but even if the preterm birth is inevitable so we need to identify those cases and these deliveries need to occur in a safe place where babies can be handled appropriately they can be resuscitated appropriately and the team the neonatal team or the pediatric team is trained to look after these preterm babies so delivery room care would be more or less similar to the delivery room care of a term baby except a very important difference we mentioned that they tend to lose body temperature really quickly and they also tend to lose their body fluids and remember that smaller the baby is as regards the gestation higher the total body water is more would be the implications with the fluid balance so these babies are right at the time of the birth the early uh, premature babies they would be delivered and they would be put in a small plastic sheet so that we can conserve both their body temperature and also the fluid and the humidity and then they are transferred to the neonatal unit where you would do observations and monitoring depending upon the problems that the baby has you do all the right things maintaining body temperature is essential so you can take help of so many maneuvers and gadgets to maintain the body temperature you can put the baby in incubator under a radiant warmer or you can if the baby is stable otherwise you can keep the baby skin to skin with mother called the kangaroo care and this has proven its efficacy around the globe not only in the developing countries but also in the developed countries fluid and electrolyte balance we are going to talk about that oxygen respiratory support if needed all premature may not need surfactant replacement but those who are born very very small less than 30 32 weeks so those who develop respiratory distress syndrome they would need re surfactant replacement we we'll talk about the problems with feeding so if they are not able to take feed orally so you have to start them on parental nutrition later in the life they would need iron and the vitamins of course infection prevention is very important so this is how the kangaroo mother care looks like the babies keep skin to skin with the mother uh, of course the head is covered uh, with a cap uh, and uh, with this actually the temperature of the body baby's body can be well maintained and there are so many other advantages of kangaroo mother care that uh, we have evidence for oxygen need to be really careful with that you need to balance the risk of injury because of hypoxia and because of hyperoxia especially the injury that might occur to the eyes leading to ROPE or to the lungs leading to chronic lung disease 
so you need to be careful about that you can give oxygen in so many ways but remember that oxygen is a drug so it need to be prescribed and it need to be assessed appropriately so that you do not uh, uh, give lot of oxygen leading to hyperoxia and its complications fluid balance we have touched upon that we have talked that uh, uh, lesser the gestation age is more is the total body water content the proportion of body weight because of free water would be more in more in premature babies lesser the gestation age more would be the total body water hence more would be their fluid requirement now the fluid requirement would also depend upon the environmental conditions if the baby is nursed in a humidified incubator compared to a baby who is nursed under a radiant warmer the fluid requirement would be different would be more who is nursed under open radiant warmer the underlying disease states actually are also something that one need to take care of a baby with birth asphyxia you might want to give little less fluids one having polyuria because of um, immature kidneys may need little high fluid those with glycosuria would need little higher fluids now these fluids are needed to correct three things one to replace the insensible water losses that would occur with respiration and through skin the other is the obvious losses in urine or, or from git maybe diarrhea or vomiting so the obvious losses that need to be replaced and we also need fluids for the appropriate growth and why do we need, need that so for growth actually we need the calories so for every 1 kilo calorie per kg that has to be assimilated in the body one need 1 ml per kg of fluid for the metabolism and assimilation of that calorie so you need fluid for the growth as well so term babies we might start at 60 to 70 mil per kg and go on increasing gradually to 100 120 mil per kg but for premature babies you start at the higher level 70 to 80 mil per kg on day one and you gradually increase up to 150 mil per kg per day but depending upon the factors that we have talked about earlier we might actually give 180 mil per kg per day so smaller the baby in gestation more are the requirement of the fluid less is the weight gain more is the fluid requirement etc etc so but this fluid therapy has to be titrated individually looking at what is happening with the baby's weight baby's sodium baby's urea um, the environment baby is uh, nursed in the gestation age of the baby the birth weight of the baby all these parameters are very important that would help you titrating the fluid volume for each baby if the baby is not able to take feed orally which most of the early premature would be uh, then you, you you have to give some calories so you end up giving them total parental nutrition which would be able to provide some flu well sufficient fluid but some degree of calories and and the nutrients for the growth of the babies but tpn has its own inherent complication that one need to be looking for enteral feeding would again the method and the amount would be individualized based upon the gestation and the weight and the tolerance of the baby oral feed that's the ideal thing if the baby is able to take breast milk that would be the feed that the baby would need but if uh, the baby is not able to suck or swallow then the way ahead is to give the expressed breast milk either through nasogastric tube or orogastric tube or with a spoon or a syringe but human milk is what the human babies need the concept of trophic feeds uh, we we know that the baby's um, intestinal system also is not mature their uh, stomach may not be able to tolerate they may start vomiting they may develop complication like enterocolitis so what we do is we start with a very small amount of feed like 10 ml per kg per day and this is called trophic feed and see the tolerance and we gradually increase on the feed and when babies are stable 
uh, then uh, we worry about their weight gain and uh, uh, human milk and for that matter e uh, even uh, the preterm milk formulas they are not able to give enough calories so what we tend to do is we tend to add uh, a fortifier in human milk we call breast milk fortifier that would increase the caloric value of the human milk and that would be helpful in the appropriate growth of the premature and low birth weight babies well who can underestimate the importance of infection prevention and control especially in this day and age especially nowadays when we talk about covid 19 and all that so prevention of infection is the important thing that one need to do by adapting the universal precautions hand washing is of paramount importance particular skin care for premature babies because their skin is likely to break and uh, organisms sitting on the skin are likely to invade and cause infection enteral feeding has been known to actually avert the chances of infection uh, by displacing um, the the bugs that would actually uh, sit there and may sometimes cause infection so early appropriate feeding is very helpful education of not only the family but also the staff members of infection prevention and control need to be at a lookout for the hospital required infections and immunization so very very important immunization all babies who are stable enough space stable from their cardio respiratory point of view they need to get their routine immunization So premature babies have uh, uh, issues with their uh, maturity of liver and kidney so one need to be careful with the drugs we can have host of problem oxygen uh, vitamin k sodium sodium bicarb calcium salts minoglycosides erythromycin furosemide the drugs so often used is a huge list these are some of the drugs and they are problem associated with almost um, i would say all the drugs so one need to be really careful about using the drugs in the premature babies for that matter um, sometimes you have to do the levels to make sure that the levels in the safe range so outcome is related again with the gestation and the birth weight now with the, the modern care in the western countries the survival for 24 weeker is 25 percent well in our setup we can hardly imagine a 24 weeker to survive well we always struggle uh, because of infection corona so many other things that uh, uh, but this is what it is a 25 percent survival in 24 weekers those who weigh 1500 to 2500 grams at birth more than 95 percent chances of survival but um some of them would go on to develop handicaps later in the life if their weight or gestation is low uh, we have talked about that and we are going to touch upon that again as well the risk of death is associated with the respiratory complications the surfactant deficiency earlier on and chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia later on the problem with with the cut necrotizing enterocolitis the reason we are so cautious about feeding premature babies nosocomial infection and there can be reasons of post discharge mortality related with the complication of prematurity itself or poor weight gain and poor growth so failure to thrive is something very important that uh, one need to be uh, taking care of right from the beginning because otherwise it would lead to long-term complication we have talked about Becker's hypothesis they are likely to develop seeds and they are likely to have child neglect or inadequate maternal infant pawning so long-term complications related with birth asphyxia mental retardation cerebral palsy microcephaly seizure disorders poor school performance similar with interventricular hemorrhage they may have hearing or visual problems uh, long-term problem with uh, uh, early respiratory failure leading to bronchopulmonary dysplasia sometimes they are uh, well they are likely to develop more wheezy episodes we really do not know why and how but they are more likely to develop bronchospasm and if they are uh, on ventilator and uh, with endotracheal tube in cyto they are likely to develop subglottic stenosis and malnutrition 
can be a consequence of respiratory failure and because of respiratory failure you would not be able to feed them we talked about enterocolitis leading to malabsorption short bowel syndrome and malnutrition the liver problems nutritional deficiencies are so important uh, so these these problem may not occur in the acute setting you might uh, stabilize a preterm baby send the baby home later on if you do not take care of their bone metabolism you do not take care of their folic acid you do not take care of their uh, protein intake you do not take care of their iron they may develop osteopenia fractures and anemias talked about the social stress and we have talked about the infections inguinal in hernia is again something very interesting that is associated with prematurity as is gastroesophageal reflux disease and hypertension so once the acute life threatening illnesses are settled the baby is uh, ready to go home provided there is good oral feeding and the baby has been gaining weight appropriately may be through breastfeeding directly or through gavage feeding and the baby is able to maintain the body temperature and there are no recent episodes of apnea of or pericardia mother need to be aware of the common drugs and the skills that she need to have when sending the baby home she need to know how to give medication if the baby is going home on medications like diuretics if the baby is going home on oxygen mother is or somebody in the family at least need to be aware of the oxygen therapy how to give it how to check it how to check for apnea how to check saturations uh they need to be aware of uh, uh the basic uh, resuscitation tools and they need to be aware of uh, the early signs of uh, ill health so that the baby can be brought back to hospital really quickly so you jo- you don't just send them home and don't do anything they need follow up for their respiratory problems for their neurological problems for the consequences of enterocolitis for their cardiac lesions for their uh, um anemia metabolic bone disease for their eye and hearing problems so in summary premature and low birth weight babies have their own very peculiar problem that one need to identify we know that the the prevalence of prematurity and low birth weight seems to be increasing so we need to identify and anticipate the risk factors so that the baby can uh, be born in a safe environment and we can have a healthy pregnancy and we can handle the baby uh, in an anticipated way so we need to know how to assess the maturity a uh, simple physical and neuromuscular criteria uh, we have touched upon little bit about the modern uh, when the, the management aspects the hypothermia the hypoglycemia the feeding issues the respiratory issues um, uh, you can appreciate that the short term outcome is promising and we need to be at uh, watch for uh, not only the early acute complication but also the late complication and the long term complication of course we have understood the differences between a premature and iugr baby thank you very much if there are any comments or questions feel free to post them and there is a quiz attached that uh, each one of you is supposed to take uh, well take that as an attendance Thank you take care